Greetings from Corvallis, Oregon. Healthcare in our nation is in crisis. Jesus calls us to the rescue. My name is Mike Huntington. I'm a retired physician here in Corvallis, Oregon, and chair of the UCC Central Pacific Conference Health Ministries Network. For 35 years, I was a radiation oncologist. I treated patients who had cancer. It was a very satisfying career for me. I enjoyed getting to know my patients and helping them through difficult times, often freeing them of cancer, pain, or other symptoms. But do you know what was most distressing for me during my career? And that was realizing that many patients avoided care, months sometimes, even longer, because they were more afraid of cost than they were afraid of the illness they were pretty sure they had. Sometimes they would wait until a crisis would force them to come to the emergency room. And then their, neg their advanced neglected cancer would be diagnosed and they would be referred to us for help. But of course, we had little chance of controlling the cancer, sometimes difficulty even controlling symptoms. Once the diagnosis was made, sometimes patients would refuse treatment because of cost. A nurse at the cancer center overheard this conversation one day. Honey, they say I have stage three lung cancer, that I need radiation therapy and chemotherapy. They have no guarantee that it will work. I'm not going to take it. I don't want to leave you and the family homeless. These are not isolated stories. These are common stories in our country, uncommon in most other developed countries. It's not that we don't have good doctors and nurses and facilities, we do. And I'll show evidence of that later. It's just that for some reason, we have decided as a society to exclude about a third of us from adequate healthcare. We subject them to constant worry that they will not get the care they need when they need it. And what will they do financially if they have a serious illness? This kind of leads me to how we doctors earn our income. You may have seen a sign like this at the doctor's office. We're sorry, your doctor's office no longer accepts the following types of insurance. You breathe a sigh of relief that you don't see the name of your insurance company on that list, but you may know of somebody in your family or friends who has been turned away at the doctor's office because either they aged out of um, their insurance into Medicare or their income dropped that they had to uh, accept Medicaid. In any case, the doctor was no longer available and the patients had to look elsewhere. For some patients, um, it's really this message <clears throat> that, that, that is being said. It's not your fault, but this is goodbye we found other patients whose insurance will pay us more. And what about those workers who have negotiated relatively good healthcare commercial insurance for themselves? They may be reluctant to give up something like that for Medicare for all that they don't know much about, but sometimes they realize what they need. For example, the first thing that General Motors did after the United Auto Workers strike in 2019 was to take away the workers' health insurance. During the pandemic, 7 million workers lost their jobs. And as a result, 2 to 3 million people, families and workers, lost their health care insurance. This is according to a 2020 Kaiser Family Foundation report. The phrase that we've heard during political campaigns if you like your health insurance, you can keep it, rings hollow when you think about these factors. Today in America, we collectively pay on average $11,000 per person per year for health care. Note that this is an average. About half of us generate almost no cost because we are sick. Some will generate far more than that, hundreds of thousands of dollars of cost because of illness and many of us, thousands of us, will go bankrupt because of that. 
Since 1950, personal costs for housing and food have dropped, but healthcare costs have risen precipitously. Now, could quadrupled. You'll see that this is unsustainable. And you'll also see in a minute why these costs have gone up so much and why they don't have to. In 2017, about one in four American family, uh, I mean, 25% of uh, family expenses were devoted to healthcare costs. This estimate includes out of pocket costs, but also the employer and employee contribution to healthcare and insurance premiums. The reason that employer contribution is considered a worker's cost is that the healthcare benefits are given instead of wages. So it's really, the cost is really borne by the worker. So there's ways to judge the health of a nation. And they may not be all that accurate. For example, we see that uh, in 2019, the gross domestic product had been rising. That's good. Unemployment falling. That's good. And the Dow stocks were on the rise. Annual inflation rate falling. This must be a really healthy country. But the real measurement of a country are not the Dow stock averages, not the gross domestic product. It's life expectancy, which has been falling in the United States for the past three years. It is income inequality, wealth inequality. 40% of Americans can't pay surprise bills of $400. This isn't because they haven't been saving. It is more related to the fact that workers' wages have remained flat over the past 20 years. And deaths of despair related to the upper two have been at an all high time. And trust in institutions is at an all time low. This is a more accurate indicator of the health of a nation. Our economy is not dollars or numbers. It's value. One sixth of our economy is healthcare related. What value are we getting from that portion of our economy? In this graph, life expectancy is measured in the vertical axis and health expenditures per person on the horizontal. Most developed countries spend about half of what we do. And you can see they, their, their annual costs per person stay $4,000 or below. While ours is 11,000. And the other message in this graph is that our life expectancies, as you can see here, are low by three, three years lower than the average of the other developed countries. Worse yet is that certain portions of our society are much lower, like African-American males, six to eight years lower uh, life expectancy than the average in the United States. This is, uh, this is something that's hard to measure also is that people live in a constant worry that an illness or an injury might bankrupt them. That's an important quality of life factor that doesn't show up in statistical reports. And please notice that um, this is now the widest gap by race since World War II and we are at a 15 year low of, of survival in the United States for all Americans. This problem, especially for people of color, may be in part due to inequitable education, housing, opportunities. But as Martin Luther King said, of all the forms of inequality, Injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So how do we currently get our healthcare? Well, through an accident of history, that is wage controls during World War II, health insurance became tied to employment. About half of us still get our health insurance through our employer. 
over the past 50 years, commercial health insurance has changed from being an equitable, reasonable system to one in which clients are chosen on the basis of profitability for the company. They call it cherry picking and lemon dropping. As a result, the healthy and the wealthy have affordable health care and access to their doctors, but the unhealthy and the unwealthy tend not to be covered by private insurances. And as a result, one in three Americans are unable to afford adequate health care. You probably know someone in that category, perhaps within your family. So employer-based, actually it's only two and a half percent on the marketplace, uninsured, eight and a half percent, and 40% through public funds. Why does it cost so much? Do we use more healthcare? Do we use more prescription drugs? Are our healthcare outcomes better than other countries? The answer is no to all three of these. The main underlying problem is that we have not found a way to control costs. We have made healthcare a commodity that allows individuals to profit, egregiously profit at the expense of people who are ill. The insurance industry determines what services are available, how much service is covered, who you can see, and what your costs are going to be. So when you think about that claim about freedom, Freedom to choose your health insurance, that doesn't mean a lot when you see how much of your future is controlled by your health insurance company. So why? Why is this happening? Well, there's a number of reasons. The complex and confusing healthcare insurance system is a major reason. Here you see on the left side of the screen that Duke University Hospital employs approximately two billing clerks for every hospital bed. The, the Health Sciences Center in Winnipeg, uh, Canada, employs less than one billing clerk for every 100 beds. Why does Duke need so many billing clerks? Well, we talked about how complex our system is. 900 insurance companies, each with a dozen plans, and each of them requiring some form of negotiation with the healthcare provider. Doctors and their staff provide, spend hours on the phone getting pre-authorizations and fighting to have claims paid for. Medical inflation in Canada is held to about half of the American rate because of their lower overhead. Canadians hospitals operate on a 12% administrative overhead while American hospitals have 25% overhead. So the defenders of the health insurance industry imply that multiple insurers allow freedom of choice. In reality, there is very little choice in commercial insurance because employers may have only one or two plans to choose from and often those plans are restrictive in terms of networks and services you can receive. Insurance companies determine what the services are available, how much is covered, and which doctors you can see. The CEOs of the health insurance industry are not evil. They are simply running a business. But I think we can, we can, we can agree that they're in the wrong business if the ultimate goal is population health. Health premiums supply royalties. Um, advertisements on Sports Center. In 2017, AARP received $627 million from United Healthcare in royalties, just so that AARP could advertise for this insurance company. You could actually say that AARP is an insurance company. Oh yes, they do lots of good things too, but it's good for us to be aware of what's not so good that they do. Abraham Lincoln said, 
that the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done that they cannot do at all or cannot do so well for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. We provide certain services publicly because we feel they're important enough and difficult to do individually that the public should pay for them. These are schools, fire, police, roads, clean water, parks. But there are also faith-based reasons to provide care for everyone. Healing the sick was central to Jesus's ministry in the world and to his identity as the Messiah. Jesus's healing ministry was freely made available to all. And Jesus empowered his, his disciples with the authority to heal the sick in his name. Indeed, the United Church of Christ has long supported the concept of universal health care. In 2009, the 27th Synod General Delegates adopted Resolution 13, an urgent call for advocacy and support of health care for all, the right of all individuals to medically necessary health care, including long-term services. The resolution encouraged the church at all levels to advocate for legislation for comprehensive medical benefits. These benefits include that the plan covers all persons, regardless of immigration status, everyone. If we need any evidence to support this on a very selfish reason, then we can learn from the pandemic that those most vulnerable, the frontline workers were not covered if they did not have citizenship and they contracted the disease in much higher numbers. And of course, the entire population was at higher risk because of that. Second characteristic is that there be no financial barriers at the point of treatment for people to get their care. The plan must provide comprehensive benefits. And that includes vision and dental and hearing. It offers a choice of physicians and other health care healthcare providers. It eliminates racial, health, ethnic, and other disparities for health care. You can see um, the text of H.R. 1976, which is the current Medicare for All bill, in an appendix that you may have received by now. So how would this be paid for? Designated taxes that would um, be used only for healthcare, there'll be public taxes, and the greatest likelihood that they would be less than what most Americans are now paying out of pocket and in premiums for their healthcare. Multiple studies have shown this to be true, and um, they are summarized in a Physicians for National Health Program a document on the web that you see there. Just go to pnhp.org slash financing. So you could call this not socialized medicine, but socially responsible medicine. What can we do? What can you and I do to rescue ourselves from this crisis that we've allowed to happen? Well, Martin Luther King did not say, I have a plan like some of our presidential candidates said this last session. He said, I have a dream. In terms of healthcare, every person gets the healthcare need throughout life, birth to death. Every person has living conditions that allow them to be healthy in the first place, that we get rid of food deserts and healthcare deserts. We our dream says that no one goes bankrupt because of health care bills. That no one delays care because of cost. The biggest step towards fulfilling the dream of universal health care in the last century was the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, which made health care much more affordable and accessible for the elderly and those who had low income. In this century, it has been the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, which has helped. Uh, it 
added millions of people uh, to uh, Medicaid rolls, which allowed them to get the health care that they were not getting. But now we have a Medicare for All Act, HR 1976, for <clears throat> this year, introduced in Congress. The text for this is available in Appendix E that you may have received by now. It is sponsored by Representative Pramila Jayapal of Washington State. There is also a Senate bill by Senator Sanders, 1129, which is similar to uh, H.R. 90, 1976, but less complete. And then there is a resolution which is uh, was called 5010. It is now, it was reintroduced on June 8th as H.R. 3775. And uh, it would allow states to create their own versions of Medicare for all. It is, feel, it is supported by many who feel that Congress will be too slow in enacting a federal Medicare for all bill. Um, as with other social changes, the um, states have been the innovators. And this is also what happened in Canada. Uh, in the first Medicare for all plan was in Saskatchewan in the mid 20th century, other provinces, and then the entire nation of Canada followed suit over a 20 year period. From 2008 to 2018, the growth and spending per enrollee, enrollee under private insurance increased over 52%, while under Medicare, the growth was less than 22%. This slide demonstrates two truths about our healthcare system. First, our healthcare outcomes are the worst in the developed world. Second, once you are allowed healthcare in this country, your prospects for health and long-term survival become the best in the world. So we'll see this unfold here in just the next few seconds. Back to the first truth, the tragic state of our healthcare <clears throat> outcomes compared to 16 other nations we would like to be number one on this ranking in the uh, vertical column. We're not. We're down here, ages zero through 65, 69. We are at the bottom of six, 17 nations in terms of life expectancy. Pretty tragic. But after age 65, look what happens we rapidly climb to the top of the list. This is a patriotic slide. We can be proud of our country's doctors and healthcare facilities and nurses that allow this remarkable achievement. It's pretty clear to you, I'm sure, that the problem is that most of our lives, for many of us, we're not guaranteed access to healthcare like people are once they reach age 65. We get sick and we die because we do not get the care we need. So how do we put all this information to action? <clears throat> First, remember that dream. Every person gets the health care they need. Every person is allowed healthy living conditions. No one goes bankrupt because of health care bills. No one delays care because of cost. So we have the dream. Now let's make a plan. <clears throat> it starts person to person. <clears throat> there is a crisis. We need a rescue team. Start by talking with members of your church. Listen to their experiences with our healthcare crisis. Perhaps they haven't had a problem themselves, but you can pretty well bet that they will know someone in their family or friends or community who has suffered because of our healthcare system. You can start your own healthcare team or ministry in your own church and consider it a book club or uh, an ad hoc committee to learn about how deeply our system, our healthcare system is troubled. Educate yourself about the crisis through your library system, the online and Trusted sources include the Kaiser Family Foundation, the Commonwealth Fund, 
Physicians for a National Health Program and Healthcare Now. You can Google them. You can also review candidates that are running for office, any public office, because they will have power to make change for the better. So go to Ballotpedia or other sources and find out who candidates are. Recruit your own candidates. If you know someone that's well qualified, that would be a good leader, go to them, ask them to run for office. Influence them, tell them your story. You can hold a coffee at your house for candidates. You can provide the candidates with your stories and data they can use in their campaigns and after they are elected. Tell your legis legislators what, what you need. Um, find those people nationally by going to house.gov or senate.gov and you can find who your federal uh, representative and senator are, senators are. At the state level, simply type in uh, in the search box, find my legislator and it will ask you for your uh, zip code and your name and they will find your legislator. You can say something like, I'm your constituent, thank you for, and do your research to find out what you can thank them for, but please sponsor true universal healthcare legislation that protects my family from healthcare related bankruptcy. Get involved in the grassroots movement in your area for universal single payer healthcare. Invite a member of your nearest universal healthcare activist group to facilitate a living room discussion. Uh, you can find activist groups near you in Appendix C that you should have. Um, and you can call me, Mike Huntington, uh, at that phone number or at my um, email address. <clears throat> uh, you can um, invite members of your uh, these groups to come. You can create resolutions for healthcare, universal healthcare to be signed by your congregation, your conference, your city council, county commissioners, and school board. <clears throat> you can publicize those resolutions. Let your legislators know about them and how you want them to create a public funded, publicly funded universal healthcare system. You can Google um, and say, find me healthcare for all, and then insert the name of your state. <clears throat> or you can start with the name of your state and then type in for single payer. And it will probably bring up groups um, within reasonable distance of you that you can get in contact with. One such group um, in Oregon is Healthcare for All Oregon. <clears throat> it is a statewide 501c3 not-for-profit membership organization of over 130 uh, organizations and endorsers. These include unions, churches, civic groups, and other not-for-profit groups and individuals. So we have healthcare in a crisis. Are we the people going to be part of the rescue. As I close, I want to leave you with two thoughts. <clears throat> Our healthcare system is in deep crisis. It is fractured, inequitable, poorly performing, and twice as costly as it should be. The second thought is that we don't have to let this continue. We have a dream and then a plan and we take action for generations People of faith, including those of us in the UCC, have worked to improve health and health care for everyone, especially the marginalized and underserved. Now, more than ever before, we have a chance to rescue our health care system from crisis and create a truly universal health care system that, like Jesus, excludes no one and includes everyone. Thank you.